Go. We are in the middle of this um, series we're calling I Life, Being Virtuous in a Virtual World, or you could talk about how do we make disciples uh, in a digital age. Uh, so far, we've looked at uh, how communication is changing in the digital age. In the age of Twitter, we are seeing an acceleration of information and the effect that has on us. Uh, we've, uh, we've considered the issue of online pornography, I'll put that very carefully, uh, which uh, much of the internet is given over to. Uh, last week, Andrew looked at... Um, learning and the impact that uh, Google and Wikipedia, those places where we can go to find the information we're looking for, actually changing the way our brains work and uh, making us think in a a more shallow way and um, that is very easily distracted. And you might have connected with any one of those. And I thought just right at the beginning, it would be good to just say... uh, here are a few book recommendations that we found helpful as we have been uh, going through it. This book, Flickering Pixels by Shane Hips, How Technology Shapes Your Faith. That's a good general overall uh, read. I don't agree with everything in it, but it's very thought-provoking. Uh, This one is a little bit more in-depth. Tim Challey's The Next Story, uh, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. Fantastic, very thoughtful, well worth reading. If that looks a little bit thick, this one doesn't. Uh, The Scent of Lemons, Technology and Relationships in the Age of Facebook. Brilliant book um, by an Irishman. Really, really good. Those are the three general ones. I'll mention these two uh, a little bit later on. But do have a look at those if you'd like to um, after the service. Today, we're looking at uh, what we're calling I Like, which is the issue of identity, online identity in particular, and, uh, and Facebook. Can I just ask you, who's on Facebook? Okay, who's not on Facebook? Oh yeah, there are one or two of you. Brave souls, well done. Um, let me pray before we dive into this, and you might be thinking, what on earth has this passage in James got to do with Facebook? And we'll find out. Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you that it speaks to us in our particular context. And Lord, as we have been working through this series, what it means to be a disciple in a digital age, we have been struck again and again by things that we haven't really thought about before and yet you uh, think are important. And Father, we pray as we look at identity and, uh, and how we uh, express that on Facebook this morning, uh, may it be something that uh, uh, touches each of us. And speaks into each of our lives. So come by your Holy Spirit, we pray, and illuminate your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. In uh, the uh, groundbreaking uh, book, which has just been released, called The New Digital Age, by Eric Schmidt, who's the CEO of Google, and uh, Jared Cohen, who is the CEO of Google uh, Ideas, which is their think tank, uh, he says this, In the next decade, the world's virtual population will outnumber the population of the earth. Figure that one out if you can. Practically every person will be represented in multiple ways online, creating vibrant and active communities of interlocking interests that reflect and enrich our world. That is the world that we are heading into as we are on the frontier of this digital age. And I wonder, where do you keep your online identities, your online profiles? Uh, Anybody still on MySpace? Didn't think there would be. Uh, Anybody uh, branched out into Google Plus? Oh yeah, one or two, one or two, very good. I haven't tried that. LinkedIn? Yes, there's the businessmen and women among us. And, uh, And then we've already seen Facebook. And most of you were on Facebook. And uh, just a few interesting things about it. For those of you who don't know, Facebook is an online social networking site. Uh, It was founded in 2004 by a guy called Mark Zuckerberg. Um, But in 2012, it was valued at a staggering $5.1 billion. You won't believe this, but in March of this year, 1.11 billion people were using Facebook. That was over a billion people. Two years before that, it was only 500 million. So you can see the speed at which it is growing. Remarkably, 
8.7% of those 1.1 billion users are actually fake. And it might concern us as parents that 7.5 million of them are actually under 13, which goes against Facebook's policy. 5 million of them are under 10. 665 million people use Facebook every single day. You know who you are. The average number of posts in a month is 36. So most, the average user will post at least once a day on Facebook every month. Uh, the average number of friends on Facebook, do you know how much that is? This is where you can all judge about how, how popular you are. Are you ready? 141.5. Yes, Megan is like, come on, I've got more than that. Brilliant. And uh, the total number of Facebook friend connections, so the relationships that Facebook facilitates, is 150 billion. That is a lot of connection. And there have been 1.13 trillion likes. You know when you just kind of click on a, you like an article, or you like a status update, or you like a share, or a comment. 1.13 trillion likes, that's a, a million billion, I think. And there are 4.5 billion likes every single day. Who has liked something already this morning? Yes, awesome, and of course it's this talk, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, and of course, Facebook encourages us to do exactly that, uh, because that's what makes them money, because it allows them to target their advertising. When we say, I like this, they go, okay, if, would you like this advert then? So uh, yesterday, as I was writing this talk, uh, I clicked onto Facebook, and there, right at the top of my page, was this huge banner which said, more of what you care about, like your favorite pages, and start hearing from them. You've got to give it to them. That is a very, very clever revenue um, yeah, increasing kind of uh, ploy, isn't it? Because I can just say, I like to be advertised to about that product, that product, that product, and that product. Thank you very much. Now, why is it then, if that's what's going on, why is Facebook so popular? Well, I want to offer you two thoughts this morning. Facebook is so popular, I suspect you use Facebook because Facebook offers you control and Facebook offers you approval. Let's look at those in turn. Let's think about this first idea that Facebook offers you control. We like to feel in control, don't we, as human beings? Uh, it's linked very closely to well-being, to physical and mental health. Uh, and this, uh, the way I'm talking about control here is to have control is to be able to make choices in your life. But you need the right amount of control. So uh, enough control brings you a sense of optimism and hope. You can make a difference. You can change. You can do something about your life. It allows you to dream dreams. It allows you to set goals and plan for those goals. If you have no control, actually it leaves you feeling hopeless and fatalistic. Uh, you can either uh, be depressed by that in, and just kind of stew, or you can uh, kind of get really angry and, and just kind of rage against the injustice and the helplessness of it. Perhaps you've experienced that lack of control. But there can also be too much control where you are left with an, oversense, an overwhelming sense of responsibility. And interestingly, that too can lead to paralysis, uh, anxiety, or isolation, a sense that uh, it's all about you, it's all up to you. Now, sadly, I couldn't find any ping pong balls this morning, but so you just have to go with me in your imagination. But Charlie is sitting here in, in the second row, and if I threw Charlie a ping pong ball, do you think he'd catch it? He probably would, wouldn't he? Now, if I... Yeah, give him that, give him that, come on. Give me confidence there, confidence. Um, but if I threw 12 ping pong balls at him, how likely would he be to catch even one of them? Very unlikely, unless he just aimed for the one and ignored the other 11. And that's the phenomenon of overchoice. We can cope with one or two, but as soon as we are presented with lots 
Our brains shut down and we find ourselves paralyzed by the choice. And Facebook, it offers us control. It gives us the ability to choose. So you can choose your profile, can't you? Um, you can choose what personal information you're going to share, what pictures you want to, prom- um, to post, or what application you want to promote. I keep getting uh, one at the moment from a friend of mine, which is Candy Crush. They drive me nuts, so I just kind of ignore that, but that keeps coming back at me. Um, you get to choose what status update you want to put out there uh, today. And... Um, It's a lot of fun, and actually you also get to choose which photo of you, which is your profile photo you want to put up there. And there are a a lot of uh, different ways of thinking about how you choose your your profile photo. So you you might go for the buddy-buddy kind of approach, which is you and your friend, uh, or friends. I'm sure you've seen those. You might be a face cropper. I must confess, I'm a face cropper, so Jess took a fantastic photo of me and Charlie. Sorry, you're in this again, brother. Um, and, uh, and I thought, I really like that photo, so I, I cut Charlie out of it and, uh, <laughs> and used it as my Facebook photo. <laughs> That's a confession for you. Um, so I am a face cropper. Or perhaps you are a Zoolander. Do you know Zoolander? When you... And you pose like a model, like that. You must have seen that. I know there's one or two out there. Or maybe you're a surrogate. That's the one you've chosen. I don't know if he's he still got it, but Darren for ages had a cartoon version of his face, which was his, uh, uh, his surrogate profile picture, a cartoon version of himself. So you can choose your profile, but of course, you can also choose your friends. You can choose who you should poke. Never completely understood that. Um, I've only ever had one friend who repeatedly poked me, so I just poked him back, and and that was as far as it went. Um, You can choose who you should add to your friend list. You can either accept their friend request, or you can ignore their friend request. Uh, You can choose what you can see in their profile, how much of their timeline you want to see. The other day, and I realized that some of you might have seen this conversation, because it was in my comments, uh, I had been posting up occasionally um, Bible verses that kind of had spoken to me as I'd been reading them, and... um, and I got a comment on one of the Bible verses. There was from a particular app on my phone. And uh, my brother, who is a priest in Australia, in Perth, he uh, said, Rod, he said, um, I seem to be getting random Bible verses from your ESV app. I love the ESV, but I'm really getting fed up with these Bible verses. And then the second comment said, don't worry, uh, my friend has shown me how I can just erase them so that I don't get them anymore. And I was like, that's good for a priest in the Church of Perth, isn't it, to be getting rid of his Bible readings that keep coming through on his Facebook page. And what you can begin to see here is actually Facebook perhaps offers us too much choice. It promises to connect us with anyone, anywhere, at any time. It suggests to us friends, doesn't it? It actually encourages us to go kind of friend hunting. And we get to choose. And there are so many to choose from. In fact, there are too many to choose from. Malcolm Gladwell, the social commentator in his book, Tipping Point, said this, to be someone's best friend requires a minimum amount of time. More than that, though, it takes emotional energy. Caring about someone deeply is exhausting. At a certain point, at somewhere between 10 and 15 people, we begin to overload. And so Facebook, where the average is 141.5 friends, and many of us have more than that, and we try, we don't keep up with all of them, but we try and keep connected with them, we find two things going on. The first is we begin to see that our friendships are surface friendships, where we enjoy intimacy but without responsibility. Uh, There's a a phenomenon called uh, kind of networked individualism, and that's where we create relationships with people, where we share interests with them, where we uh, can enjoy the same favorites together, but we are still not a community but a network of individuals. And so we're going into those uh, networks asking ourselves, what can I gain and what have I got to give so that someone else gains? It's that sort of give and take. And they're terribly easy to leave. You just kind of disappear one time and move on as you change. And we can be part of lots of those 
things. But we find actually they begin to erode time with our real friends and our time with God. So we can develop these surface friendships, but also these selective friendships. Who has ignored a friend's request? There we go, quite a lot of us. Who sets their privacy settings quite carefully? All sensible things to do in many ways, but you notice what we're subtly doing there. We are showing favoritism. We're picking the people that we want to relate to. And James, in this text that we've got before us, challenges the early church about both of these things. He says, avoid surface friendships. You know, there was the church. They were like, fantastic. We're getting rich and influential people into our church. We like rich and influential people, don't we? Yes, we do. Um, We want rich and influential people in our church. We do, really. But to discriminate in favor of the rich is wrong, says James. And uh, what is going on there? They're discriminating both in the church, among yourselves, says verse four, but you can also read that as in yourselves. So they become a divided community with divided hearts because they have chosen to choose one type of friend over another simply because of what they are wearing, because of the amount of money they have. And so James says, avoid these selective friendships, these friendships that are are based on on appearance, on the gold rings that he's wearing, where uh, this church was showing special attention and becoming, he says in verse four, judges with evil thoughts. And James here, really important point, reminds us that we don't have to choose He says, favoritism is wrong in verse one and verse nine. Discrimination is wrong, he says, verse four. Why? Because it's God who chooses, not us. There's something subtly wrong if our Facebook doesn't look like our church community. Because we've chosen to leave some people out. But it is God who puts us in the family of his choosing, not ours. And his choice is based on love. His love for us, for all of us. It's based on grace and mercy, not how good our profile picture is or the number of friends that we have or the amazing comments and status updates we put out. You see, Facebook offers you control and that might not be a good thing. But why do we need this control? Why is it something we want? Well, it's because ultimately we want approval. And we like to feel at ease, don't we? We're human beings. We want to be ourselves. You want to say, accept me just as I am. You want to be at ease in your own skin. And you want others to favor you when you are being yourself. And that, I think, is absolutely natural. Do you realize, interesting here, this... um, Uh, this phrase where it says don't show favoritism in the Greek uh, that that literally means uh, to receive someone's face interesting isn't it when we're thinking about Facebook you know we want to be valued simply for being us and we want the approval of those that we care about and Facebook at least on the surface, offers us the opportunity to be ourselves, but just to a lot more people. So it it gives us a platform to share our lives, to see what's going on behind the the scenes of our lives, to see the photos of our family holidays and our days off, uh, to see what's going on in our lives as we update our status again and again. And it can be a place of total acceptance and complete approval. And the great thing is you can measure that approval. The number of Facebook friends that you have. The number of likes you get for a status that is updated or a fantastic photo that you're really rather proud of. Or the comments all from friends who love you. And of course you've got the shares of your common interests. But what that ends up doing is it ends up encouraging us to perform to an audience. I don't know if you've noticed this in your Facebooking. 
we begin to realize that we find value, our sense of worth and significance in the reaction we receive to the things that we post. So we communicate in order to get a reaction. And it's a a particular kind of reaction. You can't dislike something, can you, on Facebook? You can't do it. You can only like. And so it, it teaches us to phrase things in such a way that you can kind of talk about the fact that you've had a rubbish day, but you, don't, you can't like the fact you've had a rubbish day. So you will say something like, uh, looking forward to watching a movie with a tub of ice cream tonight. Like, code for... Work has been dreadful today. I'm looking forward to comforting myself. You see, what what that means is we're not being ourselves with our friends. We have this sense that the world is always watching and that now we have a microphone, a cyberspace stage, and so we are performing to this global audience. And it means there's no private space anymore. I remember a friend of mine uh, saying to me that his children um, have a different experience growing up to him. So when he was young, he would be in that social context at school or uh, you know, on the street, uh, in the park, wherever it was, and he'd have to perform with his friends. He'd have to be cool and he'd have to fit in so that he avoided being bullied or ostracized or whatever it was. Um, but then he could go home to his bedroom, to his house, and be himself, and just relax, and not worry about any of those things, because his friends weren't there. And he said his his children don't have that luxury anymore, because now they see their friends in their bedrooms on Facebook all the time, saying what's going on in their homes and with their families. And they feel like suddenly that space that once perhaps was private is now public. We all have the sense of this invisible entourage that we need to entertain. And that creates this drive to uh, self-exposure. We live in a culture where uh, we see the creation and consumption of intimate details of our lives. It's ironic, isn't it, that it is all about our status. And I don't know about you, but that can leave... You depressed. There's actually a phenomenon post Facebook depression. I made that up, but it's, the phenomenon is true, the name is, is my own. Because if you think about it, when you, you go on and, uh, you know, and I see what Inga's doing on Facebook. I don't know if Inga's on Facebook, but um, I'll pick her because she probably isn't. And I think, gosh, look, Inga's so creative. They've got an amazing family life. Look at those original things they're doing together. Um, you know, and they're so quirky. I just, I, my life in comparison is so boring. I've got nothing interesting to say. Inga is always posting wisdom onto her Facebook. And so what do I do? I think I've got to think of something that's as quirky and as cool and as wise as Inga. How am I going to do that? And you begin slowly but surely to realize that your Facebook world actually looks better than your real world because you're performing. Tim Challies in his book, The Next Story, says, here in the cyber world, I can be popular. I can be powerful. I can be somebody and I can do it all at the expense of who I really am. And James in this passage reminds us, though, that we don't have to perform. We don't have to perform. See, verse 5, he says, God has chosen the poor. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but the rich in this passage, they were trying to make a point. They were coming into church wearing fine clothes, wearing their gold rings. They wanted to be liked. They were dressing to impress They wanted the acceptance and the approval of the church as a whole. They were doing what we do on Facebook. In the first century, you just wore bling instead. And it was working for them. They were getting that favor. But James says, no. God loves those who can't perform. God loves those without an audience. God loves those with nothing to say. Because he loves you as you are. So Facebook offers you control. It offers you approval. 
And Jesus offers you something different. You see, Facebook encourages you to take control yourself so that you can then win approval from friends. But look at verse eight. James says, love yourself, and then you can love your friends. In fact, he says you can love your neighbors. And how can we do that? How can we really love ourselves so that we can love our friends? So that we don't uh, take control and make choices in order to win approval. Well, verse 12, I think, gives us a clue. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That's uh, the law of liberty. The royal law, says verse 8. It's the law of the Messiah. Not the Torah, not the Old Testament law, but the law as it has been fulfilled in Jesus, the law that he has obeyed, the law that he has kept on your behalf, the law that says, actually, because of Jesus dying on the cross in your place for your sins, you are accepted. That's why we could pray as God's reconciled people to reconcile a broken world, because you are accepted have been accepted. Because of Jesus, you have God's approval. And when you realize that, that your acceptance and your approval are found in Jesus and in no one else, only then can you truly love yourself in a way that is not based on the approval of others, but is based instead on Jesus on who he is and what he's done. And it's only when we get that right, when we love ourselves because of Jesus, that then we can love our neighbor in a way that isn't about favoritism, isn't about our choice, but is about freedom. Freedom to love the person that God has put us next to in this community called the church. So I just want to say two things practically. Use Facebook if it helps you love your neighbor. Ask yourself questions like, does it enhance or replace real life friendships? If it enhances them, which it does, great. If it replaces them, not great. Are you finding that your friendships are selective or surface friendships? How much time are you on Facebook rather than having a coffee or a drink with a friend? Use Facebook if it helps you love your neighbor better. But secondly, use Facebook if you love yourself. Now, I don't mean that in a narcissistic way. What I mean by that is use Facebook only if you are sure of your identity in Jesus. Only if you are sure that he loves you as you are. So ask yourself every time you go on, am I measuring my approval through this social network? Am I finding myself subtly performing or spinning my life for the benefit of that invisible audience? Does your online identity reflect your offline identity? Or are you putting on a little bit of a show? So James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And he calls us to live like we believe it. That is how James defines faith. And if we live like we believe it, we will find that we avoid favoritism. And we enjoy freedom. Let's pray together, shall we? Can I ask you to stand?